What happens when we sleep is a mystery, or is it? Did you know that when you sleep it typically looks like this? And did you know there is a way to nearly always remember your dreams? Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this final video in the biopsychology topic, we are finishing our exploration of biological rhythms. Biological rhythms are repeated patterns of changes in the body that are regulated by an internal clock. Previously, we explored circadian rhythms. These are rhythms that last for around 24 hours. The sleep-wake cycle is an example of a circadian rhythm which we go through once a day. We're also going to refer again to endogenous pacemakers. These are the internal biological clocks that regulate our biological rhythms and exogenous zeitgebers. These are the external cues that influence our internal biological clocks. So in this video we're going to explore two other rhythms known as infradian and ultradian rhythms. Circadian rhythms last for around a day whereas infradian rhythms take longer than 24 hours to complete one cycle. The example we're going to consider is the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle is the time from the first day of a woman's period to the day before her next period. The length of the menstrual cycle on average is around 28 days, but this can vary between 23 to 35 days. It's controlled by hormones. In the first half of the menstrual cycle, levels of the hormone estrogen rise, which causes the ovary to develop and release an egg and the lining of the womb begins to thicken. In the second half of the cycle, the levels of another hormone rise, known as progesterone, and this helps to maintain the lining of the womb in preparation for implantation of a developing embryo. If pregnancy doesn't occur, levels of estrogen and progesterone fall, and the womb lining comes away and leaves the body as the menstrual flow. The hormone levels of estrogen and progesterone regulate the timing of this biological rhythm. But are there any external cues, any exogenous zeitgebers that can affect the menstrual cycle. In 1971, Martha McClintock investigated 135 females who all went to the same college and who lived together in dormitories. How similar would the onset of their menstrual cycle become? They found that a significant factor in synchrony is that the individuals of the group spend time together. In other words, the more time they spent together, the more their menstrual cycles changed to be closer together. How in the world does this happen? What external cue could be influencing the timing of the menstrual cycle? Well, McClintock herself raised that very question when she wrote, whether the mechanism underlying this phenomenon is pheromonal is a question which remains open for investigation. Pheromonal? What does that mean? Well, you may have heard of pheromones before. They are thought to be an odourless chemical substance that we release into the environment that affects the behaviour of others. Perhaps these airborne chemical signals are being detected by the women and it's shaping the timing of when their menstrual cycle starts. To answer this question, McClintock conducted another study with a researcher named Kathleen Stern. In this study, 29 women were involved and pheromones were taken from 9 of the women who had worn a cotton pad in their armpit for 8 hours. These pads were then rubbed, wait for it, on the upper lip of the other women at different stages in their menstrual cycles. <laughs> But if it makes you feel any better, they did treat the cotton pads with alcohol and freeze them first. What they found was that the menstrual cycles for many of the women became closer together. 68% of the women's menstrual cycles were more synchronised with the woman whose pheromones were shared than they were at the start of the study, suggesting that pheromones might be an exogenous zeitgeber that can influence the internal biological clock of the menstrual cycle. However, many criticisms have been made of the research into the role of pheromones on the menstrual cycle. One of the main issues relates to problems replicating the findings. For example, one study in 2006 conducted research with the striking title of Women Do Not Synchronise Their Menstrual Cycles. To re-examine the idea of close friends synchronising their menstrual cycles, they collected data on the menstrual cycles of 186 Chinese women living in dormitories. 
with four to eight women living in each room. Ideal conditions for synchronization if pheromones are the mechanism. After studying them for over a year, they found that these women did not synchronize their cycles, thus challenging the findings of McClintock. In fact, some researchers have gone so far as to question the whole idea and existence of pheromones and their influence on human behavior. Our third and final rhythm are ultradian rhythms. Ultradian rhythms take less than a day. You have more than one cycle of the rhythm within 24 hours. The example we're going to consider are the stages of sleep, not to be confused with the sleep-wake cycle of the circadian rhythm. One of the ways that psychologists know about the different stages of sleep comes from the recordings of the electrical activity of the brain using EEGs. Research into sleep using EEGs has found distinct brainwave patterns. When you and I sleep, we sleep in cycles of approximately 90 minutes, and during those 90 minute cycles we go through a series of stages. Sleep can be divided into two main types, non-REM sleep and REM sleep, REM standing for rapid eye movement. Non-REM sleep is divided into three separate stages, known as N1, N2 and N3, with each stage increasing the depth of sleep. N1 and N2 are the light stages of sleep, and as we go into these lighter stages, your heart rate starts to decrease, your body temperature starts to drop, and your electrical brainwave activity starts to slow down. We typically spend around five minutes in the N1 stage of sleep before entering N2. N3 is when we enter the deepest stage of sleep, which is also known as slow wave sleep. It's characterized by signals with much lower frequencies and higher amplitudes, known as delta waves. This stage is the most difficult to be awakened from. For some people, even loud noises will not wake them up. At the N3 stage, the body does some amazing things. Firstly, it's when the body repairs and regrows tissues and builds muscles. Secondly, it's crucial to strengthening the immune system. And thirdly, research also appears to suggest that it's the deep non-REM sleep that helps consolidate memories into our long-term memory. Getting enough N3 sleep makes you feel refreshed the next day, although this is also the stage when sleepwalking and night terrors occur. In contrast to non-REM sleep, there is REM sleep. REM sleep is sometimes known as paradoxical sleep because your brain waves look more like when someone is awake. However, your skeletal muscles are in a state of paralysis except for the eyes, and this is why it's called REM, because our eyes start to move rapidly. As you may be able to see from the graph, the amount of non-REM and REM sleep within a 90 minute cycle changes throughout the night, with the first half of the night spent mostly in non-REM and the second half of the night consisting of more REM sleep, and the REM sleep is when we are thought to dream. When we have a full night of uninterrupted sleep, a typical sleep cycle progresses through the stages of N1 first, then N2, and then N3, but then we go back up to N2 again before entering REM sleep. In a now classic study, William Dement and Nathaniel Kleitman used EEG machines to record sleeping and dreaming. Specifically, they wanted to see if there were any differences in dreaming between non-REM and REM sleep. There were nine participants in the study, seven male and two female, but only five of these were studied in detail. Participants were allowed to eat normally during the day, but were not allowed to drink caffeine or alcohol, as these are substances that are known to interfere with the quality of our sleep. Shortly before their normal bedtime, they would arrive at the lab where they went to sleep with electrodes from the EEG attached to their scalp. They found that when they were woken up during non-REM sleep, participants could rarely remember their dreams, around 7%. In contrast, when woken up during REM sleep, they could often vividly describe their dreams around 80% of the time. So, if you want to remember your dreams, the trick is to wake yourself up during REM sleep. Therefore, this study demonstrates that there are distinct stages to our sleep. However, research into the stages of sleep have been criticised in relation to its samples. This is because the samples used in these studies are often very small, as can be seen with the five studied by Dement and Kleitman. Such a small number makes it hard to generalise the results to others, especially when there could be individual differences in people's biology, hormones and age, which might all influence sleep. 
Therefore, it could be argued that our understanding of all training rhythms could be further strengthened with larger samples. And finally, a further issue with research into all training rhythms relates to the settings in which they take place. This is because sleep laboratories are very artificial settings. I mean, think about it. We all know what it's like sleeping somewhere different for the first time. It's usually a terrible night's sleep. The bed feels different, the pillows are just not right, and there are unfamiliar sounds. In fact, forget about a comfy pillow, try going to sleep with electrodes stuck to your head, and not to mention a bunch of researchers watching you sleep, ready to wake you up at any moment. Studying sleep in this manner could lead to people's sleep stages being altered compared to normal, and therefore it could be argued that the research into all trading rhythms lacks ecological validity as it's not reflecting ordinary sleep. If this video has got you even more intrigued about the psychology of sleep, then I've linked below a list of books and podcasts for you to explore. But now it's time to check your understanding of what we've covered in this video. I'll present one question at a time, you can pause the video to answer it yourself first, and then press play again to reveal the answer. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.